let's jump into today's study. Let's pray and we will get into Revelation 17. Father, thank you that you're good to us. Thank you that you're kind. Lord, we pray that we would repent of sin in our life. We pray that we'd repent of idols in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for this coronavirus that, uh, yes, it's disrupting us. It's, it's changing everything, but we thank you for it because we know that nothing is wasted in your economy. What the locusts have eaten, you can restore. Thank you, Lord, that you can use even this situation to bring about good. We thank you for that. We pray these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, we're still in Revelation 17, of course. There's so much in Revelation 17 and 18. I want you to know that I started working on these two chapters months ago because I knew that there was so much in here and there was just a lot of stuff I did not want to uh, skip over. And so last week we looked at the woman that rides the beast. I think without any doubt we can be certain from all of the iconography and the text that we got to look at, that the woman that rides the beast is Inanna. That's the queen of heaven. In Akkadian, that's Ishtar. And so now we're going to look at not necessarily the woman that rides the beast, but we're going to look at Mystery Babylon the Great. So these are very related. This woman and this city are, are sometimes considered to be one and the same. And and of course, we're looking at some uh, metaphors, we're looking at illustrations, we're looking at analogies, and, and exactly where one starts and where one ends is sometimes a little bit difficult to discern. But we're going to kind of just flow with it. We're going to go and we're going to realize that the imagery that we're seeing, the symbols that we're looking at, take us back all the way to ancient Babylon, all the way back to the Tower of of Babel. And so I've called this the Tower of Babel, Mystery Babylon the Great, versus the New Jerusalem. Now, is there a contest? You better believe there's a contest. There's a huge contest. You see, Satan has created his mountain city of idolatry, and that is in, in contrast, it's in competition with God's mountain city of joy. And here's the thing, you get to choose. You have to choose which city you want to live in. Each one has a price to pay. Each one has an entrance fee. Now, God has made it freely available if you want to come into his city, but there are certain things you can't bring into his city. You can't bring pride. You can't bring perversion. You can't bring idolatry. And you may say, well, that's too high of a price to pay. Well, Maybe it is. But you can join Satan's city where all those things are freely available. But I want you to know, he will exact a price. And at the end of the day, you'll discover that the price to be in Satan's city is not worth it. Because it will lead to depression, it will lead to pain, it will lead to suffering. Eventually it leads to death and separation from the one who wants to give us above and beyond what we could ever ask or think. So we see in Revelation 17, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. But the angel said to me, why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So we're going to take a look at these passages. Specifically, we're going to look at mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations, of the earth. 
because we're going to see that this goes all the way back. We have to go back to the garden, the garden of Eden. Eden in Hebrew means pleasure. And it's amazing that we see in Isaiah chapter 47, God is speaking here to the nation of Babylon, to the, the, the empire of Babylon. He says, therefore, hear this now, you who are given to pleasures. This word here, adina, it's the same root word as eden. It means pleasure. Now, is God against pleasures? By no means. God is the one who created pleasures. He wants us to enjoy the good things that he's created. He wants us to enjoy this beautiful world. He wants us to enjoy uh, relationships, physical relationships as well. So it's all blessed by God. But when it's used out of context and it's perverted from its true purpose, then it becomes something that is harmful. So you who are given to pleasures, who dwell securely. It's interesting, this is the same phrase that we saw when we were looking in Ezekiel chapter 38. The one who sits securely. Hayoshevet lavetach. Who say in your heart, I am and there is no one besides me. I shall not sit as a widow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. In Revelation 18, we see the same words there, the same imagery where God in Revelation is speaking against the city of Babylon. We see the same thing spoken of in Isaiah chapter 47. Now, again, thinking back to the garden, in Ezekiel chapter 28, God speaks about Satan here. He says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. This is the anointed cherub. We dealt with him back in Revelation chapter 12. So I encourage you to go back and look at that teaching. But he says, you were in Eden, the garden of God, and you were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. So again, he was in this place of pleasure. God created the garden of pleasure for Adam and Eve. But you recall that Satan wasn't satisfied with what God had given him. He wanted more. He wanted something greater. And so he said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars or the angels of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. He staged a coup. And as a result, because of his actions and because of the lies that he told to Adam and Eve and that they believed them, they began to covet in their heart. This was the beginning of idolatry. When Satan came along and said, well, you can be something else, is when idolatry started. What they didn't realize is that they already had everything. But he planted that seed, and they let it grow in their hearts. So they started to covet. And as a result... Therefore, the Lord God expelled the man from the Garden of Eden. And haven't we been trying to get back to Eden ever since then? We've been trying to get back because we know that we lost something. We know that there's more to this life than, you know, to be in that continual cycle on the hamster wheel, right? In the rat race, whatever you want to call it, we know that there's more. There's more than just getting up, going to work, coming back, sleeping, repeat. There's more to it. And we see this because people are hungry. People go to, to places of entertainment, to pubs and all kinds of places trying to drown their sorrows. Or they let something else, maybe their work becomes their God. Maybe a relationship is their God. We're trying to find some substitute to numb the pain and to make it go away but it won't it won't go away there's only two options we can be part of god's kingdom or ultimately part of satan's kingdom we have to choose between them and as a result satan was expelled from god's mountain and he then went and created a counterfeit 
city of pleasure, a counterfeit city of pleasure. Now, we looked in previous studies, we looked at this correlation between Enlil, Marduk, Bel, and Satan. And we saw that in sometimes in the ancient Sumerian, he was known as Ekur, which means the great mountain. And it's not surprising then that we see these mountainous structures around the world because these are cult centers. What was he trying to do? I believe Hebrews 8.5 gives us the answer. Just as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, because it was a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, so too Satan is trying to do as above, so below. As above, so below. That's his motto. If you look into occult literature, which I don't recommend, but you'll find this term is everywhere. As above, so below. And what Satan is trying to do is take the things that are up there in God's domain and he's trying to bring them down here and he is going to be the king of the mountain. That's the plan. But we have to understand that God also has a mountain. Remember, we just saw in Ezekiel chapter 28, you were in Eden, the garden of God. You were on the holy mountain of God. You were in Eden, the garden of God. You were on the holy mountain of God. That holy mountain is the new Jerusalem. I will be sharing scriptures demonstrating that further in this study. But Satan wants to make himself the king of the mountain. And we know that from Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, where it says, O son of the morning, the word there is Helel, Helel ben Shachar. The word Helel sometimes translated Lucifer, probably a poor translation. But the word there, Helel, becomes Elil in Akkadian and Enlil in Sumerian. Enlil and Satan are the same person. Enlil is his ancient name. It means Lord or Prince of the Air. And he was the foremost god of the Mesopotamian pantheon. And he was sometimes referred to as Kurgal, as a great mountain, according to Michael Lindman from Encyclopedia Mythica. What did Satan say? I will rule the mountain of assembly. You are on the holy mountain of God, Ezekiel 28. God says in Jeremiah 51, Babylon, behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain, who destroys all the earth, says the Lord. I will punish Bel in Babylon. One of his names was Bel. Bel means Lord. Bel, Baal, or Baal. They're the same individual. And so you have these cultic centers, these ziggurats, artificial mountains that are created in the Mes ancient uh, Mesopotamian area. You have a ziggurat of Enlil at Nippur, house of the mountain, mountain of the storm and bond between heaven and earth. Revelation 17, 9, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And we see from uh, Wendy Doniger from Merriam-Webster's Encyclopedia of World Religions, she writes, during the first millennium B.C., the Babylonians worshipped a deity under the title Bel, meaning Lord, who was a syncretization of Marduk, Enlil, and the dying god Dumuzid, or Tammuz in the Bible. Bel held all the cultic titles of Enlil, and his status in the Babylonian re religion was largely the same. So we see that Satan is out to make himself as this great mountain. And not only is this in the literature, but it's in the archaeology. And you can go to these places, and you can climb up them, or sometimes in them, and you can see these ancient cultic centers. Just a quick review. Before the fall of Adam, the two realms, the earthly realm and the spiritual, these were one pre-fall. They had a common existence, but then afterward, they became different. And Satan became the god of this world, Jesus says. And then, of course, the, the one true God, he has 
partitioned himself. He's removed himself to that heavenly spiritual realm. As I shared a few weeks ago, when God opens up the heavens, he opens up his heavenly tabernacle, fire will descend upon the earth. That day is coming. Jesus was pining for that day. Oh, how I wish that the baptism of fire had already come. It's coming. It's coming, but we have to decide, are we going to live in the Babylonian kingdom or in the heavenly kingdom? Do we want God's authority, God's economy, God's way of doing things that are pure, that are holy, that are righteous? Or do we want to stay in what is comfortable, what is known in the Babylonian system, full of idolatry? That's the question before us. We see that he's coming and we have the curtains here to just give us a, an image of what it's going to be like when he rolls back these, these skies. He will destroy in this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations, Isaiah says. And Isaiah 64, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Ezekiel, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Stephen said, I saw, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man. In John, in Revelation, I see, I saw heaven open in a white horse. And in chapter 6, the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. That is what is coming. The veil between heaven and earth is going to go away, just like those curtains. So too, the veil between our domain and God's domain will go away, and the two dimensions will become one again. But are we ready for that day? Are we ready for God's fire to descend upon the earth? I'd submit that we're not. And to understand how we got here, we have to go back to Nimrod, the great rebel. He was the first to introduce idolatry or the Babylonian system. We read in Genesis chapter 10, Nimrod began to be a mighty hunter, a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Well, the word Nimrod, this literally means let's rebel or rebellion. And then we have this, this uh, description of what happened to him. Who hechel lichiot gibor ba'aretz. This suggests that Nimrod experienced a change that he began to be. He started this way and then he became another thing. He changed somehow, something transformed him. What was that transformation? He went from being a, a regular guy to a not so regular guy. Well, it's interesting that Marduk, the patron god of Babylon, it may be related linguistically to Nimrod. Uh, Says, uh, Pinches, and others identify Nimrod with Marduk. The signs which constitute the name of Marduk, who also is represented as a hunter, are read phonetically Amar Ud, and ideal, uh, ideographically, which is a pictograph representing the idea, they may be read Namra Ud, or in Hebrew, Nimrod. This is according to JewishEncyclopedia.com. So Nimrod, let's rebel, could be the same individual as Marduk, who became the patron god of Babylon. And we saw earlier that Enlil, Bel, Baal, Marduk, these are all one and the same. It's all rebellion. It's rebellion. That's what it goes back to. We read, in the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom was Babel, Erech, in the land of Shinar. So he established Babylon, a rebellious city and a world system that God denounces throughout the scriptures. And this location of this rebellion was in the fertile crescent between the two rivers known as Shumer or Shinar. Uh, Shinar probably comes from Shnei Na'arot, Shnei Na'ar, which means two rivers. So it's between these two rivers, which is the same as Mesopotamia, between the two rivers, between the rivers. Is probably the same thing. And Shumer and Shinar are, are very much related linguistically. According to Josephus, 
Now it was Nimrod who excited them to the contempt of God, to believe that it was their own courage which procured that happiness. He also said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again, or that he would build a tower too high for the waters to be able to reach, and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers, so says Josephus. According to Targum Jonathan, or also known as Targum Palestine, they say Nimrod was a mighty rebel. Same word there. Uh, Lemrada, same root. And you can see the, the root for Marduk is in there. Before the Lord, therefore, it is said, from the day that the world was created, there hath not been as Nimrod, mighty in hunting, and a rebel, Lemrada, a rebel before the Lord. He's the ultimate rebel. But rebelling against what? Against God's righteousness? Against God's goodness? Is that really what we want to do? Do we want to follow in his footsteps? I would argue no. But this is a decision that you have to make. God won't make this decision for you. You have to decide, are you going to follow in Nimrod's footsteps? Or are you going to follow what God has for you? What God has for us is joy. There's joy at his right hand forevermore. There are pleasures. We can't even begin to imagine they're so good. Or we can stay on the tried and true, the path of Nimrod, the path of Babylon. But it leads to death, ultimately. Well, we see that Babylon was known as the abode of the gods. According to Andrew George out of England, he says, many great buildings are said to bridge the gap between the lowermost and uppermost levels of the cosmos. Of course, this is in a very much uh, spiritual cosmological sense, uh, ancient mythologies. The A Shangil is the or A Sangil is the palace of the gods, the temple of Marduk. And it was no ordinary sanctuary. In the religious ideology of the day, it was the cosmic abode of the king of the gods, the place from where he ruled the universe, the archetypal cosmic abode, modeled exactly on the cosmic abodes of, namely, the Apsu of Ea and the Eshara of Enlil. When Marduk declares his intention of building himself a home, the house turns out to be the city of Babylon. So it's not just the tower, but it's the whole city is considered his home. This is where the abode of the gods was as it were. According to the A. Shangil, comment, A. Shangil commentary, a text which uses traditional Babylonian exegetical scholarship to reveal, hidden in the ceremonial name of Marduk's temple, quote, A. Shangil house with top raised, aloft, A. Shangil house whose top is high, A. Shangil equals house beloved of Marduk, and A. Shangil equals pleasure palace of the gods of heaven and the underworld. So the Asangil is the whole city of Babylon. And this place is known as the pleasure palace of the gods and heaven. There's that idea of pleasure again. Is God against pleasure? No. He's all for it. He wants to give us joys beyond our comprehension. Pleasure at his right hand forever and ever and ever that never goes away. But what Satan, the only thing that Satan can give us is a perversion of what is good and true and right. That's all he has to offer is a perversion. And yes, he can offer pleasures, but they're ephemeral. They're fleeting. They're vapor. They're gone in a moment. That's all he has. And then people get stuck in this cycle of chasing the dragon again and again because they're looking for more pleasures. God will give us pleasures that will never end, never go away. But Satan will give us only a counterfeit. Andrew George goes on, In pious and religious literature of the first millennium, a sangil is repeatedly given epithets that confirm this doctrine, most notably Ekal, Ekalili, the palace of the gods, according to the same text 
a sangha was built expressly to serve as the home of the gods. So Babylon was this place specifically to be a home for the gods. Babylon, then, is the home of the pantheon because it is where all of the gods of the universe gather for the divine assembly. The divine assembly. That reminds us that in Psalm 82, verse 1, we read that God, that is, yud heh vav he stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. So, on, on, on occasion, we get this glimpse of what is happening behind the scenes in God's throne room. We know in the book of Job that there was a divine council called, and Satan was among those who went to the divine council. And God says, where have you been? Oh, you know, here and there, roaming here and a little there throughout the earth. So he has some access, apparently, but that's not his normal abode. He has a different headquarters, a different hangout place, Babylon. As far as we can tell, Bab-el means gate of the gods. Bab-ili. Bab meaning gate, ili meaning gods. It's the gateway of the gods. This is what it's intended for. Could that tower be the thing that somehow allowed that to happen? I believe that is the case. This tower, the Tower of Babel, is called the Etemenanki. And could it be the real Tower of Babel? This is in the land of Iraq. Uh, This is uh, just a little bit south of Baghdad. And we have the ancient ruins of Babylon. And this right here was known as the Etemenanki. A little bit bigger. There again, the Tower of Babel. I am persuaded that this is, in fact, the real place, that this was the actual place where the tower would have stood. This is the tower that that Nimrod, the rebel, let's rebel, placed there. Do we have any evidence for that? I believe we do. We have Nabopolassar, who reformed, re- performed repairs on the tower. Nabopolassar? is the father of Nebuchadnezzar. This is a text that was discovered. He says, At that time my lord Marduk told me in regard to Etemenanki, the ziggurat of Babylon, which before my day was already weak and badly buckled. So he did not begin the construction on this place. He was not the first to lay its foundations. He said it was already badly, it was in bad disrepair. He came to fix it, not to create it. This thing had been there for a long time. To ground its bottom on the breast of the netherworld, to make its top vie with the heavens. Through the craft of exorcism, the wisdom of Ea and Marduk, I purified that place and made firm its foundation foundation platform on its ancient base. In its foundations, I laid out gold, silver, gemstones for mountain and sea. I bowed my neck to my lord Marduk, I rolled up my garment, my kingly robe, and carried on my head bricks at earth, mud bricks. I had soil baskets made of gold and silver and made Nebuchadnezzar my firstborn son, beloved of my heart, carrying alongside my workmen earth mixed with wine, oil, and resin chips. So both the king, Nabopolassar, and his son, Nebuchadnezzar, get into the work. They don't just have the slaves do it, but they themselves roll up their sleeves and they went to work. And then talks about his younger boy. I made Nabu Similisir, his boy, a boy, issue of my body, my darling younger son. Take up mattock and spade. I constructed the building, the replica of Esara, in joy and jubilation, and raised its top as high as a mountain. For my Lord Marduk, I made it an object fitting for wonder, just as it was in former times. Nabu Palasir did not create the Tower of Babel. He simply repaired it. But of course, these things would take a long time. And so Nebuchadnezzar continued the work. And we have an inscription. This is an inscription on Borsippa by Nebuchadnezzar II. He says, The Tower, the eternal house, which I founded and built, I have completed its magnificence with silver, gold, 
other metals, stone, enamel, bricks, fir, and pine. The first which is the house of the earth's base, the most ancient monuments of Babylon. I built and finished it. I have highly exalted its head with bricks covered with copper. We say for the other, that is, the, this edifice, the house of the seven lights of the earth, the most ancient monument of Borsippa, a former king built it, they reckon 42 ages. So according to Nebuchadnezzar, he says, I didn't build this thing. He, he worked on it. He constructed its, its repair, but he did not build it. He, he reckons that uh, 42 ages before, or maybe his counselors reckon that some 42 ages before him, someone had built this tower. The tower is incredibly ancient. But he says, but he did not complete its head. Since a remote time, people had abandoned it without order expressing their words. Interesting that people had begun to build this tower and then they abandoned it. That kind of reminds us of a story we've heard in the book of Genesis. He says, since that time, the earthquake and the thunder had dispersed the sun-dried clay, the bricks of the casing had been split, and the earth of the interior had been scattered in heaps. Merodach, or Marduk, the great god, excited my mind to repair this building. I did not change the site, nor did I take away the foundation. And there you can see the, uh, the outline of this uh, inscription that has been found. It reminds us of Genesis 11. Let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. So the Lord scattered them abroad and they ceased building the city. It sounds just like what both Nabopolassar and Nebuchadnezzar are saying in regard to this city. This is a uh, possible reconstruction of the Etemenanki. Uh, you can see this model at the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. The Etemenanki, Temple of the Foundation of Heaven and Earth. So uh, in Sumerian, Etemenanki, Temple of the Foundation of Heaven and Earth, is the name of a ziggurat dedicated to Marduk in the city of Babylon of the 6th century. The Neo-Babylonian dynasty was originally 91 meters in height. It's unclear when Etemenanki was originally constructed. Andrew R. George argues that the reference to a ziggurat at Babylon in the creation epic, Enuma Elish, is more solid evidence. A Middle Assyrian piece of this poem survives to prove the long-held theory that it existed already in the second millennium B.C. So this was not created. We have textual evidence that supports the opinion that it had already existed in the second millennium B.C. There's no reason to doubt that this ziggurat, described as ziggurat apsi elit, the upper ziggurat of the Apsu, was the Etemenanki. The Etemenanki is the name of that tower that we would call the Tower of Babel, as we read about in Genesis chapter 11. I'm absolutely convinced. And there's more evidence. We have parallel accounts of the tower. From Babylon, the famous Epic of Gilgamesh, we find the building of this temple offended the gods. In a night, they threw down what they had been, what had been built. They scattered them abroad and made strange their speech, the progress they impeded. And we see this, of course, in Genesis chapter 11, that they had one language, and then God came down and confused the language, and he scattered them abroad over the face of the earth and they ceased building the city. In another text brought to us by George Rawlinson, this is a Babylonian inscription on a clay tablet deposited in the British Museum. Babylon corrupted, corruptly proceeded to sin, and both small and great mingled on the mound. All day they founded their stronghold, but in the night he put a complete stop to it. In his anger he also poured out his secret counsel to scatter them abroad, he set his face. He gave a command to make foreign their speech. We see concerning the confusion of languages, the epic of Enmerkar and the Lord of Arata inscription. In those days, the land of Subur and Hamazi, harmony-tongued, 
Sumer, the great land of the decrees of princeship, Un, the land having all that is appropriate, the land Martu, resting in security. The whole universe, the people in unison, to Enlil in one tongue spoke. So we have extra-biblical confirmation, not that we need it, but it's nice to have. We have this confirmation that they spoke one language, and through the building of a tower, the languages were confused. Then Enki, the Lord of abundance, whose commands are trustworthy, the Lord of wisdom who understands the land, the leader of the gods, endowed with wisdom, the Lord of Eridu, changed the speech in their mouths, brought contention into it, into the speech of a man that until then had been one. So we have the building of a tower. It upset the gods or potentially God. They had one language and then they were confused into many. We have ancient texts telling this. I believe that's just great confirmation of what the Bible has already told us. And we see that ziggurats were named staircases between heaven and earth. In Babylon, it was the temple of the foundation of heaven and earth. In Borsippa, temple of the wielder of the seven decrees of heaven and earth. In Nippur, the temple of the mountain breeze, the temple of mystery. In Sippar, the temple of the stairway to pure heaven. The temple of the god Dadia, etc. We have then the temple of the ziggurat, exalted dwelling place in Kish. Temple of the exalted mountain, the Ehur Sakkalama. We have the temple of exalted splendor of Enlil, temple of the god Nana, temple of the foundation of heaven and earth in Dilbat, and the temple which links heaven and earth. You can see that the temple was intended to be a connecting point between the two domains. Yes, people did not have computers like we do today. They did not know how to fly spaceships, etc. But they were not dummies. They understood some things. And this is so parallel to what we see in Genesis chapter 28, where Jacob is fleeing from his brother Esau, and he goes and he, he finds a place to sleep. He puts a rock under his head as a pillow. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. Jesus says to Philip, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Jesus is saying that he is the connection between heaven and earth. But Babylon would have you believe that you can build a tower, that there's another way to get there, that Babylon is the place where all the gods congregate, and that's all you need. But it's not true. It's a lie. It's a counterfeit. God is the only one. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of our Lord, Yeshua. He's the one that we serve. He's the one that we seek. He's the one that will give true peace and joy and lasting happiness. He's the only one. So who is this Harlot that God has vowed to destroy. As we've been looking through the text, we see that she's called the great harlot. She sits on many waters. She's fornicated with kings of the earth. The whole planet are involved with her fornication. She sits on a beast, sumptuously dressed, holds a cup of abominations. She's known as Babylon the Great, mother of harlots, drunk with the blood of saints. The beast that carries her has seven heads and ten horns. This beast was, is not, and will ascend again. The world will marvel at the beast. We're told that the seven heads are mountains. There are seven kings, there's plus the beast. Ten horns are ten kings. These kings will make war with Jesus, Yeshua. We're told that the waters are people of the entire world. And that the horns hate and burn the woman and that the woman is the great city. These are the things that we learn in Revelation 17 and 18. And we will continue to study uh, these different points. But these are the things. These are the qualities 
of this woman, of this city, this harlot that God has vowed to destroy. Why has he vowed to destroy her? Because she's a counterfeit. She was created by Nimrod, the rebel. And that's the first place that idolatry was set up, where false gods came and established their supposed kingdom. Oh, it's a kingdom, and you can go and serve it. But again, it exacts a tremendous price. And when Jesus comes back, that kingdom will be destroyed utterly and completely because there is no place for it in God's kingdom. Absolutely no place. And so many of us carry little gods in our hearts, gods we can't see, and our neighbors can't see either. And in the age of the internet, we can have even more gods that people don't see. But you know about them, and God knows about them. They have to be dealt with. If we don't deal with those false gods, we will have no part, no part in God's kingdom. We have to put those aside. This mystery Babylon the Great, it's a city and a false belief system of idolatry, which is rebellion, coveting, lust, perversion, and more. There we see Ishtar, as we discovered last week. She's riding on this winged lion, griffin with a scorpion tail. And who is she pulling? Who is the beast pulling? Enlil, Satan. He's the one driving. Satan is driving. And it's his beast, which Revelation says the beast is the Antichrist. And so what is she? She's all the stuff that people want, all that pleasure without God. It's a perverted pleasure. It's not the real thing. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Now in the literal Greek there, Iechusa Vasilian. The one having a kingdom. The one having a kingdom. I've heard various theories that this is actually Rome because John was talking about who was reigning back then. I'm not persuaded. This woman goes all the way back to Inanna, back to Ishtar, back to the Tower of Babel. It's the idolatry that's in our hearts that has reign, that has a kingdom over the whole world. It's not Rome. Rome was just one more branch of this tree. But it wasn't the root. What is the root? It goes back to ancient Babylon, to that tower that the great rebel decided to build, to overcome what God had said, to challenge what God had said, to have revenge on what God has said. And we see throughout Scripture that God has a vendetta to destroy her, to destroy that city, to destroy that kingdom. And he most certainly will. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has a, a, a vision. And he says, the first, he sees these series of, of beasts, and the first was like a lion, like a lion, and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. Well, isn't that what we're told in Revelation about the beast? That he will be the greatest that the world has ever seen. And we can see here in this iconography, as we see here as well, this lion is on the very walls of the Ishtar gate that were one of the uh, eight gates of Babylon. And you can see this lion has wings, just like in the graphic. Ishtar is standing in, in a lion griffin that has wings that is pulling the chariot that Enlil is controlling. <laughs> what an incredible trio. You have the harlot, all of 
the perversions that the world wants. Give us more of that perverted paradise. Here you go. This is your representation. This is your goddess. Worship her. She'll give you everything you want. And because mankind worships that goddess that is going on this beast, but who is the one driving? Enlil is the one driving unbeknownst to us. Unbeknownst to us. We see in the book of Revelation that it was the dragon. It was the dragon that gave the beast his power. He gave his throne. He gave his authority. Everything he gave to the beast. And we know that according to the book of Revelation chapter 17, that they are going to hate the woman and destroy her. This idol that so many people, kings, priests, pastors, everyday kind of people, bow down to. And I'm not only talking about pornography. It's idolatry. It's idolatry, an abomination. We bow down to these things, and Satan allows us to, to worship these things because they serve his purpose. But ultimately, eventually, that idol is going to be taken away so that we would worship Satan only. That's why they're going to destroy the woman. They're going to destroy the woman. This Inanna, this queen of heaven. We see that the goddess Ishtar, usually referred to as Belit Babili, the lady of Babylon. And again, here we can see that she's on a ziggurat. She's surrounded by her eight-pointed stars. And who is she standing in front of? Her grandfather Enlil with symbols of other gods. You see, God has hated this woman for a very, very long time. And in Isaiah 47, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For you shall no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal. Remove your veil, take off the skirt, unveil the thigh. Pass through the rivers. Your nakedness shall be uncovered. Yes, your shame will be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not arbitrate with a man. Sit in silence and go into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For you shall no longer be called the lady of kingdoms. No more. And you said, I shall be a lady forever. Therefore, hear this now, you who are given to pleasures who dwells securely, who say in your heart, I am, and there is no one else besides me. I shall not sit as a widow, nor shall I know the loss of children. Oh, yes, you will. This goddess, this goddess has the world under her thumb. This is the one who reigns over the kings of the earth, who reigns over the TV stations, the radio stations, who reigns over the social media, who reigns over all things on the internet. It's so easy. It's so easy. What does God tell us? Come out of her, my people. Come out of her. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Now, one way we could read that is say, well, this city has has been just preying on innocent people. Maybe. Maybe. But could it be? If we understand the word saint, saint doesn't mean somebody who is morally perfect. That's why we have the word kedusha and kedesh, which mean female and male prostitutes. They were 
They were holy. They were wholly set apart, completely set apart for a purpose, not a good purpose. Even we saw, and last week I shared with you, that this woman is also known as Kadeshit because she was set apart. She was holy, but not in a good way. We want to be holy unto the Lord. A marriage is holy, not because it's perfect, not because the man is perfect or the woman is perfect, not because they never say mean things to each other, not because they never have unfortunate thoughts, not at all. The reason that a marriage is holy is because it's only two people. And as long as you keep it with just two people, it's a holy matrimony because it's set apart it's exclusive those two people are what make it a holy matrimony if you bring in a lover from the outside it's no longer a holy matrimony if you leave your socks on the floor it's still a holy matrimony if you leave the toilet seat up it's still a holy matrimony if you burn dinner it is still a holy matrimony but if you bring in another woman or another man it's no longer holy. That's the difference. And so could it be when then God says to come out of her, my people, that he's talking to us? Yes, those of us who, who profess to believe in Yeshua, who profess to keep his word and his commandments, that we do on, on Shabbat or maybe on Sunday or another day, but we don't have the lifestyle that says, I'm going to live for you every day, Lord. Notice what he says in Isaiah 51. Flee from the midst of Babylon, and everyone save his life. Do not be cut off in her iniquity. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He shall recompense her, forsake her, and not let us go, everyone, to his own country. For her judgment reaches to heaven and is lifted up to the skies. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunk. The nations drank her wine. Therefore, the nations are deranged. O oh, you who dwell by many waters, abundant in treasures, your end has come, the measure of your covetousness. There it is. It's the 10th commandment. The 10th commandment. Some years ago, I was just going through the 10 commandments and just kind of doing an internal check. How am I doing? I started with the first. Have no other gods before me. I am the Lord, the, your God, that brought you out of Egypt. You shall have no gods before me. And, of course, I repented. Lord, I'm sorry. You shall not make any graven images. I don't know where I was on that. I, I think I had mostly a pretty good score on that one. I think. And then, don't take his name in vain. Keep the Sabbath and... I went through the commandments, and I got to number 10. I got to number 10. And I realized that I have been coveting. I have been coveting my neighbor's house. I have been coveting my neighbor's wife. I have been coveting my neighbor's car and my neighbor's bank account. And I had to repent. And I realized as I came to the realization that I had broken number 10, the do not covet. It took me back to number one. Because through coveting, I was actually having other gods in my life. By breaking number 10, I was breaking number one. Because what I was really saying is, God, I don't trust you. I don't believe you. I don't think you're sufficient for me. Therefore, I have to look to things outside what I own, what I have. And say, oh, if only I could have that. If only I could have that thing. Then I would be happy. When God has promised to be sufficient. To give more than enough. I was guilty of the 10th commandment. I was guilty of coveting. And it's ultimately coveting, covetousness, which is idolatry. Idolatry is saying, I don't think God is enough. The God of heaven, who made heaven and earth, 
is not enough for me. I want something else. That's what this mystery Babylon is all about. And again, it's not the Vatican. It's not just Jerusalem. It's not New York City. It's not Las Vegas. It's all of those. It's all of those things. This is the kingdom that reigns over the entire earth, that has a kingdom over the entire earth. Because we all can fall prey to this. We can fall under this power. And so, come out of her, my people. Babylon has fallen, fallen. All the idols of her gods lie shattered on the ground. It's idolatry. It's covetousness that God is against. It's the one sin that nobody can see. I can't see you coveting. You can't see me coveting unless you put chocolate too close to my face. <laughs> and like, ah. Oh. But that's what's happening. Is we're like, oh, if only I could have that. But coveting, though you cannot see somebody lusting necessarily, lusting for something that they can't have, whether it's of a sexual nature or if it's money or if it's power or fame, it doesn't matter. That lust, that coveting will lead you to then commit one or more of the Ten Commandments. It's guaranteed. There's no exceptions. No exceptions. And I'm speaking right now to people who profess to believe in Jesus. I'm speaking to people who want to call him Yeshua. Or others who call him Yahusha, or Jesus, or Jesus. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what day you congregate on. It doesn't matter how you pronounce his name. But if you and I profess to know the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who sent his son, Jesus, Yeshua, to die on the cross, we claim to believe him and to follow him, and yet we have idolatry in our heart. We need to sober up. This is the time to sober up. Don't be deceived. What a man sows that he will also reap, Paul tells us in Galatians. What you sow, you'll reap. If you sow to idolatry, you're going to reap idolatry. And he tells us, Paul tells us that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is a time for us to repent. To repent. Oh God, forgive me. In Revelation 18, for all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury, through this coveting, through this competitive system where I've got to step on you to get what I want. I've got to edge my way in to outdo you so I can get what I want. That's just coveting. Old-fashioned word for a modern idea. That's where we are. Come out of her, my people. The only way God can say to his people to come out of her is if his people are in her. That's us. I claim to believe in Jesus. You probably claim to believe in Jesus too. If we claim this, we need to look in our hearts. Where am I, Lord? Am I following you? Or am I worshiping these idols? They may not be the obvious idols. And again, as, as Christians, it's so easy for us to pick up stones and, and throw them at the really obvious sins, like people who do drugs and homosexuality. We can, we can throw stones at those people all day long and say, look how terrible they are. And we can throw stones at the liberal media. And we can throw stones at, at the blue or maybe the red or whatever party you are. Say, it's, it's those guys. It's their fault. 
Let's look right here. What am I doing? Do I have idols? Maybe I'm not committing those obvious sins. I'm not coveting and lusting in those obvious ways. I'm not going to the strip in Las Vegas and doing stuff that happens in Vegas, stays in Vegas kind of stuff. That's great. If you're not, I'm glad. I'm not either. Those aren't the sins that I deal with. My sins are more sophisticated. Yours may be too. You're the sins of pride, of arrogance, that haughty look. What are these abominations? She's, she's the har- mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and receive of her plagues. What are the things that God hates? Well, let's take a look in Leviticus 11. Every creeping thing that creeps on the earth shall be an abomination to you. We just read from that in today's Torah portion. All those abominations. So yes, there are certain animals that God said, do not eat. It's a wonder. Could the coronavirus be related to those? There are different reports that say yes, some say no. Perhaps we don't know. Maybe we don't need to. Maybe we should just be obedient and not eat the things God said don't eat. When God said, look, that animal is not food for you. It's an abomination to you. Don't eat it. Just stop. Repent. Now, I don't know any Americans that think that dogs are food or that think that cats are food or that rats are food. Those In the American economy, those are not food. Those are disgusting. Who would ever eat that stuff? Well, good, because God says don't eat those. Don't eat that stuff. They're not food. And we're like, amen. But he also said that pig is not food. Shrimp and lobster are not food. He said these are an abomination. What else is an abomination? You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It's an abomination. Homosexuality in God's sight is an abomination. Now, I just said, wait, we shouldn't throw stones at them. What I'm saying is we need to be honest with ourselves. Because what happens is I can throw stones at this abomination, but not the abominations that I hold dear. Let's go on in our list. Deuteronomy 32, they provoked him to jealousy with foreign gods, with abominations. They provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to their to the demons, not to God, to gods they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. We see that Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, who required child sacrifice. Modern word, abortion. Why does abortion happen? Because people have sexual relations outside of a committed relationship of marriage, and they have babies they don't want. So you get rid of it. That's an abomination in God's sight. All right, that one's easy to throw stones at because I don't do that. I'm a good Christian. What else? Oh, dishonest scales are an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Dishonest scales. Well, I'm not a merchant. I'm not selling things, so I can't be guilty of that. Maybe. Maybe I'm not being honest in my business dealings. It's not just whether you have a scale and you weigh things or not, but are you giving good value? Are you are you kind of stacking the scales to your favor and not being honest with how you sell things or how you buy things or how you do commerce, how you negotiate and have business with others? Are you an upright businessman or woman? Are you an upright customer? Another abomination, one who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. What? My prayers can be an abomination? Uh Uh-huh. If I will not listen to the things that God said, 
It's an abomination. God said, don't do that. I do it. And then I pray. It's an abomination. And then he says in in Proverbs 6, these six things the Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look. A proud look at the top of the list. God hates a proud look. Why does he hate a proud look? Because if we were to really understand who we are in comparison to him, we would see that, that we're lower than the ants. The ants, the ants that are under my feet and I walk on them without even thinking about it. We're less than that. We're a worm. We're nothing. And yet we think that we're amazing and that people should take notice of who we are and that I should think that I'm better than my neighbor and I have this, this haughty look, this proud look, and I look down on my neighbor because maybe I can do something a little better or I, a little better IQ in this area or that area, and I think that I'm so much better. That's an abomination to God. A lying tongue is an abomination to God. Hands that shed innocent blood, that's an abomination. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that are swift to running to evil. A false witness who spreads lies. And one who sows discord among the brethren. All these are abominations. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you, look at that list. Look deep into this list. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, go study it, meditate on it, and say, Lord, search me and know. See if there's any wicked way in me that I may repent of that. Am I guilty of any of these? Do I have a proud look? Do I have a lying tongue? Hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to running to evil. Am I a false witness that speaks lies? Am I the one who sows discord among the brethren? If you are, those are an abomination. As much as a man lying with another man is an abomination in God's sight, as much as someone getting an abortion is an abomination in God's sight, as much as this mystery Babylon the Great, who's the mother of harlots and abominations, When we commit these other abominations, we're worshiping her. You're worshiping her. I'm worshiping her. Everyone proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. And mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. By the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. That is the antidote. The fear of the Lord. To understand who I really am compared to him. And when I have that right perspective with him, then I'll have the right perspective with you, my brothers and sisters. And I hope you'll have the right perspective with me. We must repent. And this takes us up to the abomination of desolation. It's all of these things put together. And then one day, someone known as the son of perdition, who will be the embodiment of of all this sin, the son of perdition, the man of sin, he will go and do the ultimate sacrilege. So what must we do? For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits the earth, eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the whole high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to receive, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. We've got to humble ourselves before him. If we will humble ourselves before him, he will restore us to the garden of Eden, the garden of pleasure. We'll be able to be at his right hand where there are pleasures forevermore. You recall the story in Hosea chapter 2. God said to Israel, she's not my wife and I'm not her husband. Let her put away her harlotries from her sight. That's what he's calling us to do, to put away those harlotries from our sight. And if we will do that, he says, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and loving kindness and mercy. 
I'll betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you were refused, says the Lord. For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. O oh, you afflicted, tossed with tempest and not comforted, behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems and your foundations with sapphires, and I'll make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stones. This is the parallel language to Revelation 21. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones, including sapphire. Again, speaking to Jerusalem. Isaiah 62, you, Jerusalem, shall no longer be called forsaken, nor shall your land be any more be termed desolate, but you should be called Hepzibah, and your land Be'ulah. For the Lord delights in you, and you shall, your land shall be married as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride. And then John sees the culmination of it all. I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. The angel says, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. He showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem. This is God's wife. This is the pure, spotless bride. The enemy established his adulterous harlot, who's just a perversion of what is good, true, and right. A fleeting, ephemeral moment that doesn't last. A moment of pleasure, but it's gone. And you got to keep chasing and to get a, a new high. But the high with God will never go away. Are you looking for the perfect drug? God is that perfect drug. And there's no hangover with Him. There's no headache in the morning. There's no bad sensation. There's no overdosing. But it requires you to humble yourself. It requires me to humble myself. That's the price of entry. Will I humble myself? Too many of us believe that just because we said the prayer, we invited Jesus into our heart, that we can live like hell. Uh-uh. That's some bad theology, unfortunately. Now is the time for us to repent. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her plagues. If I'm going to profess Christ, I had better live like Christ. If I'm going to profess his name, I had better carry it high. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. What a man sows, that he'll also reap. God has this great city in store for us, the city of our God, his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth, his Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Hebrews 12, you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. Speaking of Satan, where he was, you were in Eden, the garden of God, the holy mountain of God. We're told that Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. Babylon is the mother of harlots. But the Jerusalem above is free, and it's the mother of us all. We see that the city is described as a great and a high mountain, a great city, the holy Jerusalem. We're told in Micah that People will say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, Jerusalem. God says, I will return to Zion. And the midst of the, I dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem should be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. The new Jerusalem, and I will describe this more when we get to Revelation 21, but new Jerusalem is described as a mountain because Satan has been making his mountains as counterfeits of the one that is in heaven. He's been making these counterfeit mountains, ziggurats, pyramids, etc., that are false worship centers instead of the real one, the true one. 
God promises that we will have pleasures. And of course, Satan has promised counterfeits. God put us in the Garden of Eden. He told us that we should rejoice in his feast, your son, your daughter, etc. And Isaiah, or excuse me, Psalm 16, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's what we're seeking. That's what he will give if we'll humble ourselves and follow him and put away the adulteries, put away the idols. Idols cannot go into the kingdom. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. In this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast, Isaiah says. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are the promises that God has for us. These are the good things that He wants to give us. They're ours for the taking. If we'll humble ourselves, if we'll repent of our adulteries, if we will not allow the Tower of Babel to have that place in our hearts and and the woman that rides the beast, Ishtar, Inanna, the queen of heaven, to have that place in our heart. We may not bow down to a little statue anymore. We may not make cakes for the queen of heaven like they used to. Times have changed in that way. It's a new style. But it's still the same underlying principle. Nothing's changed in that regard. Will we humble ourselves? The Lord says, these are my feasts. This is what he's brought us to. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you are so amazingly faithful. Lord, we repent of of setting up idols in our hearts. Lord, for some, it's a sexual encounter. For some, it's power. For some, it's money. Others, it's fame. And a whole bunch of other stuff, Lord. We repent of the idolatry in our hearts. Oh God, have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us. Thank you that you're faithful. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you will, I'd like to close with this wonderful promise. It's a blessing from the Lord. Apply it to your life. Yevarek Adonai ve Yishmerecha Yae Adonai Panavelecha vi Hunecha Isa Adonai Panavelecha ve Yisemlecha Shalom The Lord will bless you and keep you. The Lord will make His face shine upon you. He will be gracious to you. The Lord will lift up his countenance upon you and will give you peace. Hashem Yeshua Mishichain, in the name of Jesus, our Messiah. Thank you, Lord. God, we bless you, God. And God wants to bless you. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Take care.